on this exciting episode of Kitchen Table Electronics Repair, what is UXW Bill going to repair for you today? Well, I have here something that I bought new back in 2004. This is an NEC ND-2510A DVD burner. This was, I believe, if I'm remembering things correctly, one of the first dual-layer DVD burners that you could get. And although dual-layer DVD burning never really took off in its time, this was quite a nice drive. Only recently, it started acting up. I went to burn an audio CD with it a couple of months ago, and I noticed that no matter what speed at which I burned the disc, the, uh, the resulting product was not high quality, and it was giving my audio CD players a lot of trouble, which came as quite a shock, because this drive has always done a very nice job on a lot of media. Anyway, then one day I had occasion to burn a DVD. I think I was actually giving someone data off of a hopelessly wrecked personal computer, an e-machine that I think the power supply had fried the motherboard in. And they were just going to replace it with something new. So I went to burn a DVD and this thing gave me a power calibration error. Which, you know, that can indicate a bad disc, but basically what power calibration is, there's a small area on the disc where the uh, disc writer can test and determine what the optimum power level for its writing laser is because the amount of power needed to produce a satisfactory burn varies with the disc and the type of chemistry that it uses. So I knew something was up because this thing was having trouble burning CDs and it wouldn't burn DVDs and it was even being a little fidgety about reading discs and it's unlikely that both of the optical, uh, both of the lasers in this thing would be bad at the same time, especially since it hasn't had near as much use as, say, some of my light-on drives have had. Anyway, the main point of this video, I don't think there's going to be anything seriously wrong with this, the main point of this video is to discuss how to actually get one of these drives apart non-violently in case you ever have to do this on your own. And one of the first things that you want to do when you're going to take one of these apart, because they all come apart about the same way, you want to open the tray. Before you shut your computer down, just eject the tray if it will come out. If it won't come out, you may have to do this with the tray closed, and it's doable, but it's a lot more difficult. Now, when you've got the tray out, you need to take this front bezel off, and basically the way you do this is you pivot up at the bottom, just easing it over a set of locking tabs, and then it lifts up and away. Then, don't, don't abuse this too much because then you'll strip the gear train that brings it in and out and then you will have a problem. I use a kitchen tool here and um, you need to liberate the front bezel. I'm not sure I can do this one-handed but I got half of it. Flip this thing around and do the other half. And then the front bezel can be carefully brought free from the drive. When you've done that Basically, then you're ready to take the bottom panel off, and the bottom panel will be a couple of screws. I already took them out on this drive, and this should, without too much swearing and hopefully no cutting of our skin, this thing should go ahead and come off. And you'll notice right away, one thing to be careful of here, there are these heat transfer pads that um, go against some of the more important chips in here. Um, in particular, these two servo drivers down here, which are responsible for running the tracking servo, as well as the spindle motor, you know, they can dissipate a lot of heat. And so they have little thermal pads that provide for heat transfer from the chips to this big metal plate on the bottom. So they get a little bit of uh, a little benefit. Now, if you look at a newer drive, you're not going to find all these components on the board because practically all the newer drives are made by light on these days and they've also benefited from a great deal of increased integration. Most any, uh, most any drive made anymore simply has the buffer memory chip, possibly a firmware ROM of some kind, the servo drivers, and usually a MediaTek chip that gives the drive its personality and makes it able to burn and read disks all in one bundled part. But this is an older drive so it has some discrete chips in it. I believe this NEC chip here is a connection to the parallel ATA bus. This up here is a Hitachi H8 series microcontroller, an H8 slash H8SX slash 1650, which is H8300 compatible if you watch my typewriter video. Now, getting this part out is a little more of a challenge. You need to be able to get this thing out. Some drives make this easier than others. 
And basically what you need to do here, some drives it's as simple as simply placing them down on the table and lifting up. Other drives have some clips or some latches and you might need to carefully splay out the metal cover but don't splay it out so far that you actually end up ruining the cover and being unable to put the drive back together. Now this thing on the top, this looks like it might not be much fun to remove. There's a set of clips here but I don't know that that's going to be enough to loosen it because it seems like there are some metal things there that might make that a one-time assembly. So let me fiddle with that for a bit. I'm pretty sure I'm going to need both of my hands even though I am a southpaw. And there it is, the laser lens itself. Now you don't want to touch that with your fingers and you don't want to attempt to power the drive in this state because the simple fact of the matter is a DVD burner, every one that I have ever seen is uh, labeled as a Class 3B laser device and Class 3B lasers are easily strong enough to be hazardous to your vision. So don't do anything stupid, especially since these are mostly invisible infrared light lasers. Now when you're in here you can look for faults and you can make sure that this little sled moves smoothly. There's definitely some evidence of dust in this drive. And the appearance of the laser diode lens right here can be important. And this one, this one's not shiny and clear with kind of a bluish or purple tinge to it. It's actually got a bit of fuzz on it or something. So I think that's why this drive has been acting up. Now if your drive is having an attitude problem with the tray, you can fix that problem while you're in here as well because right there is the tray motor that runs the tray in and out. I don't know if I can do that by hand or not. Yep, there we go. You can kind of see where the belt is and the gear train that makes all that happen and the little switch that tells the microcontroller if this thing is open or shut at any given point in time. But this can, uh, this can typically be replaced by a piece of O-ring or a simple rubber band or something. So now I've just got to clean the lens and then I'll throw this drive back together and see if it actually does read discs. And as for this thing, it did take a little bit of violence to get it to come off, but what I did, I just kind of carefully levered this plastic frame out until these metal tabs disengaged, and then I was able to carefully lift this thing up and away, and I only bent it a little bit, so I guess I get some bonus points. Anyway, that's all there is to this. An assembly is basically the reverse of disassembly looks clearer than it did. I wouldn't say it was a huge improvement, but I'll just have to try burning a disc and see. Now if you clean your own laser lens, uh, be wary of electrostatic discharge because you can kill that laser diode deader than dead if you zap it. And also be careful of this uh, suspension that it rides on because basically what that is is a modified uh, speaker voice coil type suspension. And the uh, servo drivers and the microcontroller apply electrical power to that to make the laser move up and down so it can focus and do all those things. And like I said, assembly, basically the reverse of disassembly. Put this crazy thing back in place, making sure that I put it in the right way, which would definitely be helpful. And then just click it down into place and make sure it locks. Set this thing on top. And if yours has clips or snaps that you have to deal with, go ahead and clip or snap them back into place. Pinch it together and that way the bottom of the drive won't fall out. And you can put this thing back in place. Now it's time for this piece, which just slides down over the, the open tray here and locks into place. Although again, I don't know if I'm enough of a twiddle fingers to get it to go on there properly one-handed. Maybe I am. Sometimes I surprise myself. And then this thing, this thing just goes right back on like this. You push it on there, making sure to line it up with the two lips, and then just press it down in the middle, and it should click into place. And then you can shut the drive, and you should shut it kind of firmly so that the mechanism can actually cycle up and the microcontroller knows where it is, although most of them will fix it upon restoration of power and reconnection to the computer. And there you have it. So how to take apart and put together an optical drive from a desktop computer. This works with serial ATA drives as well as parallel ATA ones because the only thing that changes is a type of connector for data and power on the back. Now you might wonder why you'd bother to fix one of these when a new one's like 40 bucks. Well, I can think of a few reasons. First of all, I would imagine this is a better drive. It's certainly heavier. 
Secondly, it has a nice headphone output on the front of it and a volume control wheel to go with it. And also, it seems that newer drives are starting to have non-functional analog audio outputs and non-functional SPDIF outputs. So if you depend on either one of those things and don't want your CD audio data routed over the uh, serial parallel or SCSI bus, um, serial ATA or parallel ATA, sorry about that, or the SCSI bus, you need an older drive that can still put uh, analog or digital audio out over a dedicated set of connectors like this one can.